Добрый вечер, шановные пани Тапанова. Это программа «Глибины буріння» и я, Андрей Пальчевский. Сегодня у нас в гостях два выдающихся представителя спортивного мира. А справа от меня господин Майк Фрателло, человек, который был назван лучшим тренером NBA 80-е годы. И самое главное для нас, украинцев, то, что он согласился возглавить нашу национальную сборную. Слева от меня выдающийся спортсмен. А олимпийский чемпион Александр Волков, которого вы знаете не только как выдающегося спортсмена, но и как депутата, как человека, который был министром спорта, по-моему, в вашей карьере был такой, который посвящает всю свою силу, страсть, ум тому, чтобы такой серьезный вопрос, как баскетбол, оставался все время в зоне внимания нашего общества. Мы будем говорить по-английски. I'm just saying that we're going to be speaking in English, and my first question is to you, how big is basketball in the United States? Can you give us any idea of how, um, we know it's a multi-billion billion dollar industry. How big is it, just to give people an idea? Well, when you think basketball is big, which it is, uh, then you realize what football, American football, is all about. If basketball is big in the United States, football is huge <laughs> in the United States. The amounts of dollars Uh, that they're talking about there, and they're in the middle of their contract negotiations right now. Uh, they have a strike going on because uh, the monies are so great in American football uh, that the Players Association and the, the owners of the teams are having a very hard time deciding how that should be divided up. And unfortunately, it looks like American basketball, NBA basketball, is heading in a similar direction from the standpoint the contract is up at the end of this season for the players. They had a six-year deal. Uh, it expires, and they are now in the beginning process of trying to negotiate a new contract. But already, they're seeing problems on the horizon. So we're hoping that it doesn't wind up like the NFL, the Football League, uh, is doing right now, but it could be there. Uh, still coming to numbers, because uh, people here in the Ukraine, I'm afraid, don't have the slightest idea of how big it is, and it can actually be called industry an industry. Let, let's say if we compare it automotive industry or brewing industry, can it be more or less on par with this, money-wise? That's uh, tough to answer because you'd have to know exactly what the volume is that these other areas are talking about and, and understand that uh, we deal in professional sports with salary caps. You have an amount of money that you're allowed to spend as a team collectively And there's two different caps. One is called a hard cap, one is a soft cap. The hard cap means this is the number and you can't go over it. Mm. So if, for example, the number were $60 million, you have to put your whole team together for $60 million. Everybody's salary has to be combined $60 million or below. That's a hard cap. If you have a soft cap, the number is $60 million, but you can go over. Mm -hmm. But if you go over, you pay a penalty. Now, some owners, the wealthy owners, don't care if they pay a penalty. They will pay that penalty to have better players and go over it. So the argument there is smaller cities, smaller markets, owners that don't have the same money can't really compete with the larger markets. So for players, they want soft cap. For owners, they want hard cap. <laughs> okay, great. Sasha, now a question for you. When you actually were invited to play for an NBA team, which was Atlanta Hawks in, in your case, what, is, what was your main motivation? Was it money or was it glory? <coughs> At that time, it was, of course, it's a dream. Over the dream, you can never dream yeah. to go to NBA. Because, of course, we're growing up in, uh, in Soviet society. And, uh, of course, we knew from the beginning there's no way we can go to NBA because it's a political situation. And uh, uh, a way how you think you can go to NBA and only go to United States for tournament and just stay there and not come back to, to, to Soviet home. Kingdom. And you will realize what's happened with your parents, relative friends. It can be a very hard time. And, and uh, even we have some propositions to do it. Nobody uh, stay in United States and uh, kind of escape from, from the Soviet Union. So you had to pluck up courage to be brave enough to... Uh, hockey players did it, ballet dancers did it. Yeah, McGillney, I remember yeah, the story. But uh, uh, I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately, mm -hmm. basketball players at the time uh, didn't escape, didn't escape. And of course, when this opportunity came up and door was open, of course, we, we start, I remember Mike Fratello, 
with the uh, uh, general manager uh, Stan Kasten, who was the GM of Atlanta Hawks at the time, came to Spain. We have a tournament in Spain, uh, 1986, and they come and they brought uh, uniform Atlanta Hawks with my name mm -hmm. in the back and give me a contract. Uh -huh. And said, you can sign right now, you can go with us. <laughs> <We're not laughs> with it was smart. easy. Yeah, yeah, we're not pushing. It's very, uh, easy. very easy. Of course, for that moment, 86, this amount of money I see, I was almost, I have to hold something to not fail in, uh, <laughs> in unconscious. <laughs> and to see my, uh, my NBA uniform with my name, it was even, even worse. So, so you were not thinking of money then? Which no, no, no. Un unlike, and this my, is what... Uh, I'm just sorry for interrupting because this is what we talk about. We, the general public, talk about now that a lot of sportsmen who go to play, be it NBA or any place abroad, be it basketball, soccer, or we don't play American football yet, but probably hockey, uh, after hockey. the show when they realize that it's huge, as you say, maybe it will be a big motivation for somebody. Then uh, we have this feeling that a lot of players actually leave not because of glory, not because they want to be great, but because they are after money, which, which is... Uh, well, it's, uh, from our point of view, uh, it's not always that welcome. Uh, I wanted to, to ask uh, Mr. Fratello a question. Uh, when you chose to become a coach, how were you motivated? Was it just, just an inner feeling or you were, again, was it after glory, after money? And have you got any, when you started your career, did you have any big numbers? Because we always think in terms of millions, billions of dollars. Some, some basketball players are billionaires. I think Michael Jordan has a billion dollar fortune, something like that, maybe more. Correct me if I'm wrong. Michael Jordan has done very well. He's, yeah. not, he's not suffering today financially. <laughs> uh, but, That's good. That's good. but Michael Jordan also is a great example of a player who had a commitment, a player of character, okay? a person of strength, inner strength. Because Michael Jordan, after his first couple of years, had achieved so much, way more than people thought he might achieve at that point, he could have very easily said to ownership, I want to rip this contract up. I want a new contract, or I'm not going to play. And it would have been a major problem hmm. because they have his rights. If he doesn't want to play and sits out, they're not going to pay him, but he can't play for somebody else in hmm. the NBA. He has to just sit. But that's not Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan had committed to the contract, and he played every year of his first contract at the number that he agreed to coming out of University of North Carolina. Now, in the end, when Michael Jordan had won championship after championship and his contract was up, now they wanted to sign him to the next contract. Michael Jordan and his agent said, let's do this. Let's sign one year at a time. I play next year. We agree on the money. So he was a smart businessman. We play the next year. We agree on the money. <laughs> so Michael made up at the end for maybe what he didn't get in the beginning. But to me, the most important thing is it was his character. It was that he understood, he signed his name, and he's going to stick by what that name means on a piece of paper. It's an agreement that they had. But, uh, still back to numbers because I'm quite sure everybody's dying to know. But just a comparison came to my mind while I was listening to you first. This is what public really appreciates. It's about your honor, what, what your dedication. And this is what everybody respects, be it in Ukraine or be it in the United States or be it in Mongolia. I don't know, people probably play basketball every, every, uh, uh, everywhere in the world. But uh, just for our uh, uh, audience to know that what uh, just a single basketball player like M Michael Jordan has made during his career is probably tantamount to 10 times soccer turnover in Ukraine. So we're really, he was thinking big. And uh, when you have a sneaker brand named after you, when Nike, I, does he? When Nike does gives he? a division, oh. there's the Michael Jordan division of Nike, Yeah, that tells you that, you're, per, that you're pretty big, okay? So <laughs> you have that piece of Nike alone, okay? Never mind you know, what he's made in his other endorsements, underwear, Hanes <laughs> underwear, okay? Yeah. Uh, you look at the motion picture that he made which, with the cartoon characters yes. where Michael, you know, winds up being a, a, a movie star with children. Yeah. And his marketing people, his agent that he, that he had represent him, did such a brilliant job 
of putting him into spots and situations where he could come out and look so good. Yes, he's a great athlete. Yes, he was a champion. Yes, he handled himself extremely well as a person, you know, off the court. And then they made good decisions for him as to where they directed him to do the things that he was going to do. Thank you. Uh, Sasha, one uh, uh, important question, I believe, about uh, how you actually build your career from start. Because I understand that, that uh, in um, uh, an American, uh, American basketball institution, to put it this way, uh, they start monitoring talented people's, uh, talented uh, prospective players since they are probably teenagers. Uh, uh, do you think in this country enough is being done to monitor the situation and then to help young players grow into great players and what Mr. Fratello is saying into great persons who would be doing uh, uh, well, uh, who would be doing well both financially, a lot of soccer players are doing financially, but I don't think they command too much respect. And this is a big problem that we have now. So, so how, how is our system working? It's, it's do you think something should very, be done? It's a very deep question, you know, Andre. And we are yeah. digging deep. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and if you, if you see a system of sport in the United States, you see it's a developed system. And I, I, I told many times, it's very simple, and I think it's worked very well. All, uh, let's say, children's sport, teenager sport, they're based on, on high schools. Local government decide how much they paid for sports program. One school they have hockey, another school they put uh, more money and attention on basketball, another school in football. And they, uh, uh, for example, you have professional coach paid by the school, professional people around, they have all equipped, good gym, good program, and plus competition who also paid by the uh, s uh, state or city money, let's say city budget. And then this competition going on all over the United States and go like a final. And next level of basketball or other sports, like let's say college sport, they already watching all this easy, easy access to see uh, this high school sport. And they see talent in there where they scouting, follow them. And then recruits from college go and negotiate with the parents, with the coaches, how they take kids to the college. And then talented kids from all high school system go to college system. And they, of course, most of them left over. Yeah. They go on career, finish sports, and probably just became amateur and uh, being which just... Which is fine. Yeah, which is fine. And next level, it's a lot of talented kids concentrate themselves in colleges. And a huge competition, a lot of colleges, big competition. And then coaches from NBA, next level, they scout, scout uh, players from the uh, colleges, university, draft them, take some players from all over the world, and NBA is already a commercial organization. College pay from college money yeah. because they have a lot of money. Plus, they're making money out of sports because it's athletes in the college not making any contracts. They play for, for no money. Students league. Yeah, students mm -hmm. league, no money. But big gyms, TV, the uh, university getting a lot of money from this. It's very important. It's a big program, especially in football and basketball. And you were telling me a story that you were impressed when, when actually it was not a basketball, it was a, a, a football match, and you said that the whole stadium, whole 100,000, almost 90,000 people, was full just watching two students' team uh, fighting, so to say. Uh, what, uh, what, what a great idea, because this is something that we have totally lost in this country. Is there any way we can... We can uh, renovate this. Uh, is there any way we can do something? We have to kind of <laughs> try to if we, catch if we want to succeed. Yeah, but it's I think we're so far away in terms of infrastructure, stadiums, arenas, and everything. We have to build our own system. We have to just take example and somehow to make it make it work right for Ukrainian realities. And, uh, so, and of 
So one, I understand that one of the reasons uh, we are uh, actually a uh, Ukrainian national team is now working under Mr. Fratello is that it's not only basketball skills. We would like to import the whole new thinking. Is that the idea? Yes. So this is the idea, sir. And well, the, idea is, the idea is ultimately to develop better and better players to come out of the Ukraine that can represent their country in the international competition. And hopefully their individual goals would be that they're good enough to play at the highest level of basketball. If it's the NBA, then that should be their dream to reach the NBA. But in reaching the NBA, they should not forget about their country. So when the opportunities come up to represent their country on national teams, whether it be the World Championship or the Olympic Games or the European Championships, they still have their contact, their heart and soul are still with their country, even though they may be earning their living, okay, somewhere else in the NBA playing against the top competition, which we see in soccer all the time. People from Brazil are playing in Spain and yeah. from Italy are playing. That's where uh, they make Alexander their living. Alexander playing in Greece, we saw that too, or in Italy. <laughs> yeah, so that, I mean, that's what we're trying to do is uh, we, we'd like to try to set a platform and develop a system whereby young people continue to grow, develop, uh, as Sasha was just saying, uh, not only infra infrastructure, but you also need coaches. You need to develop coaches uh, that can take and teach these fundamentals. And that goes back to what I had said earlier about uh, some countries have better youth programs and developmental programs at an earlier age than other countries do. Uh, and somebody has to start it somewhere. It's a very great undertaking. A lot of people have ideas, but they don't know how to follow up on the ideas. Or when they go to the necessary decision makers and say, here's what we need to do to get here like this other country is. The people don't support them because they don't see the vision down the road. They don't think long term. For them, it's, I've got to keep my office. I have to keep my mm. position for now. Let somebody else worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not what you need. You need the commitment and the long range thinking of what you're trying to get to in the end. You think Ukraine can become a source of uh, MBA class players if if, uh, let's say, if we take uh, the right approach, Sasha, you think it can happen? I'm, I'm not think I'm sure about it. You're sure about somehow, it? So we have the talent. Somehow, he has always been a lot of talented players. Uh, if um, not many people know how much young, talented players we, we're losing every year by stealing, uh, stealing from uh, school, they search, especially Russia, Turkey, as a neighbor's country, just mm. see a talented kid, talk to parents, give a little money. In some case, they took kids, took in a car, illegally crossed the border, with, as I have case, from Ukraine to Russia, ready, new passport, Russian passport Waiting ready. for the guy. Mm. And guy, you see, we see guy, we know this guy, but he already under other name with the Russian passports. Now, international uh, organi organization of basketball try to fight this. But... We have a lot of talent. We need just to make a system and a program to, to, to be basketball country. Talking, talking to be ba and, and now, look, we don't achieve much in basketball in Ukraine yet. Yes. But how many NBA players already have been in NBA? Uh, Probably we can compete with any other countries uh, because we always have players in NBA. One moment it was already me, Patapenko, Medvedenko, Pechorov and Fesenko. Already five players been in NBA. And if you count uh, Hryapa, who was in NBA, he born in Kiev also. Mm. He was actually was taken from Ukraine many years ago and, and uh, uh, given uh, Russian uh, citizenship. But, but then uh, 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 that's understood. Then I understand that uh, one of the missions which uh, uh, I hope your team will tackle here is to show to uh, the government or whatever people are in charge that basketball can be turned into an industry uh, and ca it can be a breadwinner for this country. I'm not talking, uh, I'm, I'm not talking uh, at the individual level where you have you know, perfect players who you send over to the United States or other leagues, but then what is lacking here is the industrial approach towards sports, so much of which you have got in the United States. And probably other Europeans certainly underappreciate how big, how, how big sport is in the United States financially. Now I'm talking about that because uh, end of the day, you will be uh, dealing with the decision makers, be it parliament or government, and it will be very much your task to show that it can be 
one of the prime movers uh, for Ukrainian economy. Uh, do you, in your working, in your work with the Ukrainian team, do you go that far, or you just concentrate on the? Well, well, well. I mean, I'm thinking big. Let me answer yeah. this way. Um, somebody who has great vision down the road takes that question and understands the importance of finding the next star. Yeah. Who is our next star from this country? Because when you find that young star and he develops, that star, as he goes along the way, attracts endorsements. He attracts big business people that want to associate with him. And you can bring in the auto industry. You can bring in all the different industries and, like and economy Klitschko, is produced. Like Klitschko did in this country. Uh, you know, Ronaldo in, in you know, soccer, for example, okay? Those kinds of names, you go back, Maridana, and stuff like that, where they become so great. They're such big figures, okay, and the images of them and the success. And as uh, Sasha mentioned before, when you have the exposure that high school, college, and MBA players have in the United States, uh, to divert for a second, one of the problems in MBA right now is so many players leave after just one year of college, maybe two years. The people who go home every night after work, your hardworking, everyday people, they used to turn on the TV and for four years in a row, they watched this player in college. Oh, he plays for Duke University. Mm. And the next year, Duke University. And the mm. next year, Duke University. Now, after four years, when he comes into the NBA, they go, you remember him at Duke University? What a great player. Now, they're in for one year and gone. And when they come to the NBA, Unknown. not a lot of people know who it is. So... How many sponsors are willing to jump on with a young man that they're not sure is he going to be good in the NBA mm -hmm. or not? So it took the slam dunk competition uh -huh. this year okay. for Blake Griffin to jump over a car oh. and dunk a ball after he oh. jumped over the car. That's great. I hope we, I hope we see it on the screen when, when you're describing this. And That's all of a sudden incredible. now he's got one commercial on television for the car, another commercial for this and another product and another product. Because now they say this guy is going to be a star in the NBA. So for the Ukraine, where's the next star? Who are the up-and-coming young stars that this country can identify with and grow with? But, but, in, yeah, but uh, we have a problem, you know. Unfortunately, we have no protection. We uh, uh, scouting and uh, searching by new aggressive agents who yeah. try to take anything already a little bit uh, they see a little bit uh, a future of players. They already put jump on, jump on him. Talk to the parents. Usually, parents has not from, not from rich, uh, uh, you know, families yeah. and everything. Yeah. And that players became uh, killed, young players by agent, unprofessional agent, and unprofessional pressure. And they thinking, okay, maybe it's I'm already good enough to go somewhere to play. They don't understand. Stay here, develop yourself. Be a star like Mike said. Here, people know you over four or five and then years, you know. and then you go and be, and whole country follow you. Whole whole country follow you because yeah. you established yourself here, yeah. became a star, and then and like you said, sponsors coming. We have Klitschko, Shevchenko case. It's it's it's. We have to find. I am agree completely. We have a star without star in any sport. A sports not going up. Speaking about careers in sports, uh, we are. As we, as we both know, because I used to work for sports ministry too, uh, uh, in post-Soviet sports, you normally have two types of careers. First, uh, you become an entrepreneur, something like uh, Klitschko is doing, who is still a great sportsman and he's a great entrepreneur, but he is an exception. Probably 3% of successful sportsmen become what he has become. And 97, the rest of 97, then, then they become bureaucrats in sports. Uh, uh, how does it work in the United States when a young person, like Sasha, for example, has made a lot of money, you know, dozens of millions of dollars? How is he taken care of by, by NBA? Is he taken care of by a special counsel which provides advice as per how his earning uh, should be used for him because the failure rate in soccer, for example, even places like Germany, is something like 70%. It's just incredible. People make millions, soccer players, and then by the age of 40, they're broke. 
Uh, I'm quite sure this is what is happening in this country. How does it work in NBA? Because we are told all those stories that you teach people how to drink water, use fork and knife, say hello. Uh, but are they, uh, do they have any financial advisors? That's, that's the question. I think the NBA does one of the best jobs of, of professional sports in any country at starting out with a player when he's first coming in, giving him guidance, meetings that they have to have with rookies uh, about everything, about your money, your investment, uh, protecting it, about life every day, going out and eating in a restaurant. How do you tip? How yeah. do you order? Yeah. Because everybody's not exposed to the same thing. Everybody how to smile. They, exactly. They, they, how to yeah. greet people. Uh -huh. uh, how to dress. What's the appropriate dress when you go somewhere? Because backgrounds, okay, and the experiences they've had growing up vary. You have uh, high schools that people attend that are all from very affluent families. Yet you have other high schools where everybody is just trying to pay the Humble. next bill. Yeah. Okay, you're trying to make it. And you have students that they go to school during the day. After school, they're allowed to play their particular sport. Yet other students go to school, and as soon as it's done, they can't play a sport because their parents tell them, we need you to get a job to contribute because you have seven or eight brothers and sisters combined. So all of that, you know, is important to these young guys coming in. The NBA does a great job of starting them out and trying to give them some direction. Then the next thing is the agents that represent the players must be certified agents. These, these agents that can only take 4% of their 4%. money. 4%? Of their mm. monies that they're paid in their contract. Mm. It didn't always used to be like that. Mm. Guys would cut different deals. I get yeah. 10%, he gets 15%. All right. Now, as far as endorsements, after the contract money, endorsements, a guy might take 20% of your money. You know, if he, if he gets you a $500,000 car deal where yeah. you sign a contract for three years, you do commercials on television, you drive the car, you make five, 500 that he may take 20% of that for getting you that deal. But that's different than the 4% on your contract only, okay? And then the agents have become more solid citizens now because they have to be certified agents as opposed to there used so, to be some shaky agents. Yeah, we were talking about decency again. Yeah, you know, agents and, where money would be missing all yeah. of a sudden, the player's trying to figure out. Yeah. Because the players don't all keep an eye on their money. Now, after the career, what happens? The NBA has done a great job of trying to get former players who want to stay involved with basketball. They have started the NBDL, the Developmental League. It's like a farm system mm -hmm. for the NBA. They try and get these former players to be coaches on these teams. Mm -hmm. You want to be on the coach in the NBA, bench sometime? Yeah. Here's where you start out. Others they've brought into the front office. Others they've made goodwill ambassadors. I mean, to this day, you still see them in their commercials use Bill Russell, Dr. J. Uh, McDonald's uses Larry Bird, a major sponsor for the NBA. They take these former players and try to keep them in the family. I have seen one of your commercials, by the way, well, and it was about drugstores. <laughs> we've done a little discount drug here and there. Ah, that's good. But I, I want to tie that in, if I can, to what Sasha's trying to do here. Family, the word family is very important. Mm. The NBA refers to the NBA family all the time. Sasha, in his efforts to raise money for the national team, the Basketball Federation, because the more money you're able to raise, the more first class you're able to treat your group. Okay, they feel like they're being treated the same as all the other top level teams around the world. And that's important. And I'll give you one example that maybe the people can understand. The greatest chase for a free agent took place this summer, this past summer in the NBA, when LeBron James yeah. was a free agent. Uh -huh. Everybody wanted him. Not everybody could afford him. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to go everywhere. So he selected which five or six teams he had narrowed it down to. Whether or not they all had a chance, you don't know that. But at least he gave them a chance to talk. But the selling point in the end to him, what got him to go to Miami in the end, they brought a former player, Alonzo Mourning, mm -hmm. great player. A great player, yeah, sure. Miami I'm sure people know him. had hired Alonzo Mourning, hired mm -hmm. him in the organization put him in the front office. When they went to meet with LeBron James, not only did the owner and the president, Mickey Arison, Pat Riley, and the head coach, Eric Spolster, but Alonzo Mourning came. 
And Alonzo Mourning sold LeBron James on the fact that if you come to Miami, you are part of a family. They look out for you. They take care of their players. When you walk into Miami's arena, they have a wall, a whole wall, that lists every player's name since the beginning of the franchise that ever wore a Miami Heat uniform. Mm. And you look and you go, wow, look how many names have played for Miami. And Miami's a relatively young franchise. Mm -hmm. You know, they've only been around 20-something years in the NBA. Forget Boston's and New York and Philadelphia, the ones who go back to the beginning. So this is what they've done. They've created this tradition. When you're a free agent and you look and you go, where do I want to go play? I want to play for a first-class organization. I want to be part of something that's family. And that's what they're trying to create here now. Mm, great. Uh, I was thinking of two issues, Sasha. Now, when it comes to ownership, because this is something people don't know, uh, in uh, countries like Ukraine and Russia, we're used to it that uh, major teams are all owned by what we call oligarchs. Uh, wealthy, they're your favorite word. You remember, Sasha was explaining to me what wealthy means <laughs> after he spent some time in the United States. So by no, rich wealth, and wealthy, uh, well, yeah, rich and wealthy, there's a difference. So, so those wealthy guys who think in terms of billions and then as a pastime, more or a uh, quasi-political move, they start sponsoring a certain team, uh, to, uh, turning it into whatever instrument, whatever tool they want to have. Uh, my question is for you. Do you know if American teams are also owned by oligarchs? So are there any exceptions when they owned by, let's say, city council or just individuals like in Spain? You know, for example, Barcelona, I think, is 70 percent owned by individual uh, shareholders. Yeah. So uh, have you have you got yeah, any uh, ideas? It's, it's first I want to. Uh, it's not a joke. It's just kind of joke when, <laughs> when you ask who is rich and who is wealthy. Yeah. It's example in this. LeBron James yeah. is rich, but guy who paid him money is wealthy. Yeah. How rich is he? Just just to give an idea. Yeah, is for, like example, a, for example, for uh, example, uh, its owner of Miami Heat is wealthy because he paid the checks to LeBron Jones, who is uh, rich. Yeah, but then but then again, we need numbers here, Mike, because people are dying to know. They don't realize that uh, uh, Mr. LeBron James no, no, could have made a couple uh, of Andre, hundred million Andre, bucks Andre. already. Yeah. It's very easy. You, uh, you, you can, it's you, open it's information. It's transparent. Yeah, yeah it's, it's open information. But still, but still you the go to internet, also. you go to internet, you see in the internet so how much. we so have to go with them an idea? Okay, uh, 16 million, I think, uh, LeBron, LeBron making uh, as a contract. And, uh, 16, I don't know how, no, 16, 16. 16. 16. In okay. a year. Uh -huh. But I think he made in triple of this money or, or maybe five times more in a commercial. In a commercial. So yeah. it's about a hundred million, a hundred million dollars that a star player like LeBron James is making. Well, what, what the people have to understand is with this salary cap that we mm -hmm. talked about, yeah. even though LeBron James was the most sought after free agent, everybody wanted him. Okay. And s some people had enough money to be able to pay him the most, the maximum that you're allowed to under the cap. Yeah. He did not get the most. Yeah. He took less. Chris Bosch, another free agent, took less so that they could to fit in on the same team and still allow the team to go out and get two more free agents. Two more okay. okay. They signed their own player back, Udonis Haslam. He took less, and they signed a player named Mike Miller for less. Those four players all took less to be able to play together. Yeah. However, when you say, who, who made the most money last year as a free agent? People, um, well, LeBron. No, it wasn't LeBron. Chris Bosh. No, it wasn't Chris. The most was made by a guy named Joe Johnson in Atlanta. He got the maximum number that you could get based under the cap. So let's say his number was 16 point something million, and he signed a four-year deal or a five-year deal. They can only sign you to a, a six-year, five-, six-, or seven-year contract depending on the option years that are in there. And then your outside money, your endorsement money, like you said, you add that on. So a player may make, the best players in the NBA, may be making between 14 and $16 million a year right now. 14 to $16 million. That's Now, somebody might say, wait a minute, I know uh, Kevin Garnett makes 18 or $20 million. That's because Kevin Garnett has a grandfather clause. He came into the league before they changed the rules. The rules okay. So those rules don't apply to him mm -hmm. because he's been around so long. So he can negotiate a different contract. But there's only 
maybe this many of those people left in the NBA that have those exceptions now that they can make those kind of contracts. You, you, for example, you remember when uh, Magic Johnson uh, gave up his contract to bring other players to make, it, make sure the team uh, gets stronger? Some players give up money just to bring uh, uh, partners to be stronger. I'm but uh, Joe Johnson, like you said, uh, was really criticized in Atlanta because mm -hmm. he squeeze him until then. He not give up any dollars just to make 20 something million well, and not care about if his uh, team will be uh, not strong enough for but, him. But I understand that, thanks God, this is more of an exception than a rule. I think this feeling, family feeling and this uh, team, team spirit that it's still dominating and people would think twice before taking the best offer. They would rather think of giving the best, providing the best offer for the team. If I got you right, this is what we lack so much here because we have this post-communist kind of individualistic approach which is not uh, common only amongst the general public, but it's very typical of uh, some sport prof sports professionals. Uh, talking about coaching, Sasha, which uh, uh, when, when you were not here and uh, 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 Sasha was telling me that our coaches are okay, but he said, I learned so much within the first period of my NBA stay that we cannot deal without an American coach. Tell me, please, how is American coach, how, 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 how actually, how, how does America produce their coaches? Uh, uh, because we have this system where we have physical institutes. Four years, people go, they, uh, they study uh, uh, physical education, PE, and something. But your system is totally different. And could you please dwell upon the clinics? Because this is a misleading uh, word, and you can tell the story what would happen. Uh, Sasha told me the story. You told me the, the, the clinic story that happened in, in the Caucasus. We kind of grow up... Um, in an environment, you know, we're very fortunate that we can pick and choose at colleges or universities what we want to major in. Do I want to be a doctor? Do I want to be a lawyer? Do I want to be an announcer, broadcaster on TV? Yeah. <laughs> and you can go to school and major in those things. Yeah. Uh, I know for me, growing up, I wanted to be a coach because you look back at who are the greatest influences on your life. Well, you have female and you have male influences, whether it's your mother, in my case, I had a father, okay, who was a uh, great influence, but a missing father, meaning he worked all he day. Worked he left four in the morning, he would get home late at night from work every day. Uh, yet, he's a very strong man, and I always looked at him and admired him. But the next male uh, influences on me were always my coaches, my physical education coaches, or my coaches for the sports, the young teams starting in Little League, Little League Baseball, Little League Football, Basketball, growing up. So for me, it was always, I want to be a coach. coach. I want to be a teacher in the gymnasium, and I want to be a coach. And that's what I set out to do. I never said, I want to be a coach at the professional level, college level. I just kind of wanted to be a teacher coach, and a coach. So that's where I wanted to set my goals for. What comes along, sometimes you're not ready for. You don't know. Uh, for the people out there that may get a laugh out of this, I thought coming out of college I was going to go into the gym, teach in the gym and coach. But the school that wanted me to come and coach had no opening for physical education. So they said, we can do this. You have to go back to college real quick for the summer and become certified in driver education. Driver education. And if you get a certification, a degree in that, it took uh, four or six weeks, you can come to the school and be full-time driver education teacher. I'll, I'll just tell so if you. Wanna, if you want to become <laughs> best coach, uh, best NBA coach of the year, start from driving classes. <laughs> so that's a good piece of advice. Very, so. I mean, and, and I wanted to coach. I wanted to go to this high school because it's where I graduated from. I felt a part of it. So I went back took the course, became certified, and then went and taught driver education and coached two sports that first year. But at the end of the first year, I get a phone call and the offer comes from a college. And they said, would you like to come 
and become an assistant coach at the collegiate level. I, I was like, I, I don't know. You know, I, I hadn't thought about that. My whole focus was to be good in high school someday. And I actually went to my coach, and I sat down with him, and I said, what do you think I should do? I have this opportunity. And our coach was kind of like big, a, a, like a big mother hen with his <laughs> ar arms around you, and he'd bring his children in all the time. Uh -huh. And he would always try to keep our former players, students, back at the high school. If you wanted to teach and coach at our high school, he would try to get you in somehow. There was great pride, great tradition. And when I sat down with him, he said, he looked at me and he said, you, you should go. He said, you have bigger things that I see in your eyes. He said, you should go and try it. He said, because you can come back to this someday. Go ahead and try it. So I, I felt like I had gotten his blessing uh -huh. to go and try this. I didn't know what I was trying, but it sounded like it was the right thing to do to go from high school to the next level, which was college. And that's how it worked. Coaches are so important, uh, I'll say in my life, and I never was a great uh, sportsman, but I played for the city. And uh, uh, my coach is still alive, thanks God. He's 60 plus and I'm taking care of him because he has, and uh, every time, uh, every time I need a friendly piece of advice, and the guy looks pretty humble, but he only looks humble because deep inside, he's a great philosopher and he, he, he knows, you know, he's street smart, something mm -hmm. that you don't find in the books. So, and every time we meet, he she just come, comes up with just one humble suggestion. And then I'm thinking, as is Victor, uh, his name is Victor Kligerman, I hope he's watching us. So I'm saying hello to him and uh, these coaches are so important in your life. Who was the most important coach of your life, Sasha? I'm telling you, it's, it's really without, uh, I'm most blessed to coaches, you know. Mm. I was really happy to have coaches for the head. I, I don't think any miss coaches in my career would be maybe direct me in a different way, you know. And, uh, and very important to know and take example from United States, how respect has every coach. It's the biggest guy in the high school. It's really? The biggest really? guy. Is that, is that what? It's, uh, for example, my daughter uh, studying in Auburn, Alabama University. is the yeah. biggest football, one of the biggest football, American football, uh, university in the United States. They are champion of this last she season. Have, she has a lot of prospective yeah. guys around. Yeah, them, so but <laughs> good for coach, her. Coach, Coach Chizik, Coach Chizik of the uh, team, uh, football team, college team. He is a god. I mean, uh, uh, really, he is a god. He's most important person in the college. Coach NBA college, coach, coach of college. It's huge respect. And people, I see how players from high school respect his high school coach always has uh, advice, always keep him uh, in touch. Even in NBA, they call him coach, I'm, what I have to do, I have a problem. And they still call high school coaches, college coaches. It's very huge respect for coaches. This is what we have to bring back, this uh, respect for, for coaches. Just before we finish, because uh, uh, tempus forget, time flies. And uh, one thing that I would like to clarify for the audience very much, I understand that uh, one of your missions here will be to train the trainers. This is what they do in business. So you'll be coaching prospective coaches. Is that right? Am, am, I, uh, am I thinking right here? No, we, we are definitely inviting uh, the coaches of the future that uh, Sasha sees as you know, potential so. people to take over our programs down the road. We want them to be part of our practices. We want them to be there with us. We want to share any information, knowledge, teaching techniques, ideas that we have and let them grow because that's how we did it. That's how I learned. I went to clinic after clinic mm -hmm. after clinic. Clinics would be run for one, sometimes one day clinics with five great coaches that would come in at, you know, Dean Smith, Bobby Knight, uh, Mike Krzyzewski would all be at the same clinic in one day. Other clinics would be one and a half or two day clinics where you'd go on a weekend, Friday night, all day Saturday, Sunday morning, go, drive back to your city where you came from. Summer camps. All these great coaches would run a camp on their campus during the summer. I would work those camps for those coaches. I'd, wa I'd work eight, nine, ten weeks straight of camps during the summer at different universities under different coaches to try and watch and see and just go out at night and have dinner and listen. 
I think you learn the most when you're a good listener and you zip your mouth closed. Okay? When, <laughs> you right. talk, when you talk too much, you don't have a chance to learn. All right. I hope this is not, uh, you, you, you're not uh, making a hit at me then. No, no, but no. this is my job, sir. So uh, I'm, uh, uh, just before we finish, uh, uh, one important thing is that, uh, uh, Sasha, you'll probably confirm that if we structureize our basketball, there will always be opportunities. Like if you can become a coach, you can become a color commentator, a very successful, like Mike has done, uh, and he's been monikered uh, uh, czar. Uh, uh, and uh, well, the, the concept of color commentatorship is not yet known here, but we'll, we can call it experti. And uh, uh, I, I just want to say that uh, it, it uh, it's very important that we have people like you guys as role models for this society, both uh, on the plate and on and off the ground. So I would, uh, I would, I wish you a lot of luck here. We hope to see more of you in the Ukraine, uh, more of you too. <laughs> and uh, I hope this is not our last meeting. So you're always welcome to be here and it's been a great fun and a lot of pleasure for me and I'm quite sure everybody. So thank, thank, you. thank you very thank much you. for your time. Thank, thank you very much, you. Sasha. Пані та панове, це була програма Глибинне буріння. Зустрінемось за тиждень. Світ глибший, ніж здається.